It was early in the morning on January 4th, 2015 in Ecuador's Santa Elena area. It was very peaceful because everyone was resting after a few days of celebrations. In 1.5 miles on the San Pablo Road on the Spondylus Route, the only sound audible was a couple fighting inside their vehicle. It was time for the woman to call her friend. She begged him to help her because her husband was acting crazy while she screamed. After that, she asked him to watch her son. Almost an hour, an ambulance showed up at the scene. A car had hit the 38-year-old woman. There was something wrong with what the man said. He said it was a car that ran away at full speed. One of the most famous musicians in the country had just died. That much they knew for sure. I'm Edith Rosario Bermeo Cisneros, and I was born on March 28, 1974, in the city of Guayaquil, Ecuador. I grew up in a rough part of Duran with my brothers Ty and Fernando. As a child, I was always very happy and friendly, and I loved listening to music, even though my family was not rich. This is why my parents put me in singing lessons. When I was only eight, I won first place at an event because of them. In addition, I really liked TV shows and movies. Although everyone called me Charo or Carito, I became so obsessed with Sharon Stone over the years that I changed my name to that of the actor. When I graduated from high school, I went to the Faculty of Social Communication at the State University of Guayaquil to get a degree in communication studies. While that was going on, I worked as a teaching assistant and sold Morocho, a sweet Andean drink. That is when I joined the music group Los Hechiceros, which is how I got my full stage name, Sharon La Hechicera. Eduardo Gray, the band's founder, and I got married in 1995. We had a daughter named Samantha after the main character of my favorite TV show, Bewitched. Even though things were going well in my life, I wanted more. I had been saving money to become a famous single artist, which was my dream. My family did not really back me, though. Every time I tried to talk to my mom about it, she avoided it. Poor women did not believe in me, and I had everything going against me, but that did not stop me. Between jobs, I saved enough money in 1998 to make my first album, which was called Corazon Valiente. After that, I became more and more well-known, and people thought I was one of the first people to play techno cumbia, which set the style of short skirts and high boots. Over the next few years, I mostly recorded songs by well-known acts from Peru, Argentina, and Mexico so that they would become popular in Ecuador. I showed that I was smart in business as well as a good singer. I broke up with Eduardo in the middle of the 2000s and went on to have a few relationships that were not really important. I was more focused on putting out hits like Mi Confession and Akarikiami and getting into TV, which would make me one of the most popular women in the country. In 2003, I played Ciara de Fatima, the main character in La Hechicera. I had already had some parts in soap operas, but this was the role that made me famous. I wrote and played the lead role in the show. In Ecuador, it was a huge hit that beat all scores. No one did not know who I was by that point. The newspaper El Universo named me one of the most loved people in the country, and the magazine Vistazo said I was one of the most desired women. For the next nine years, I hosted seven TV shows, appeared in five soap operas, and put out nine albums. With my underwear line, and as the face of four calendars that sold a lot of copies, I continued to grow as a businesswoman. After being single for a few years, I thought it was time to get together with someone again when I was at the top of my career. I met Giovanni Lopez, an Ecuadorian businessman who was 30 years old in 2010. We fell in love right away, and soon after, we started dating and working together. We had our first child on May 31st, 2012, and we named him Brian. There were rumors right away, even though we seemed like the perfect pair for a while. Several news sources said that Giovanni abused me verbally and physically. Things got worse between us over the years, which led to what happened on January 3rd, 2015. I had done a number of shows across the country at the end of the year. I visited the towns of Ayangue and Olon with Giovanni and our two-year-old son. We had fun with our friends there. One of these friends later took me to an apartment he had just bought. That is when I told them I was thinking about getting one for my older daughter. Giovanni got very angry about this because he did not want me to spend my money that way. 
After a few hours, we met a song producer for coffee. His boss had to talk to him about the money he owed for some songs. Again, my partner got mad because he thought I was not taking him into account when I made financial choices. He drank and argued about everything for the rest of the day. It was getting dark and there was a lot of stress in the air. Giovanni and I started making plans to go home. At that point, a friend we both knew, Dr. Roberto Blum, offered to drive ahead of us and join us on the trip. In fact, the man was worried about how drunk Giovanni was driving, even though he said he wanted to do it in case something went wrong, like a flat tire. We finally got in our cars and I drove mine. Blum saw that the fights between Giovanni and me were getting worse every time we stopped at a gas station. Sometimes I had to tell Giovanni to stop drinking because it was bad for our son to see him that way, but he would not listen. Blum came up to us and asked when we would be back on the road after having a new stop. It took us so long to get back into our car. I told him not to wait for us because we would be leaving after dinner. Blum looked a little worried, but I told him everything would be okay. Too bad it wasn't. We were going early in the morning on the Spondylus route on the San Pablo Road, which is 1.5 miles long. We were in the province of Santa Elena. Yelling, I called Blum and begged him to help me because Giovanni was acting crazy. He was also told to watch our son. Blum went to the scene to look for us at 1.15 in the morning and found a terrible scene. I was almost dead when I hit the ground. My partner and our son were in the car with me. After almost an hour, the cops and an ambulance showed up. They heard Giovanni say that I had stopped the car in the middle of the road to change our son's diaper. At that very moment, another car came out of nowhere and hit me. It then took off very quickly. I was taken to the hospital run by Livorio Panchana Sotomayor. The doctors tried hard to save me, but they were unable to. I died from multiple injuries likely caused by the car accident. I had a fracture at the base of my skull that was bleeding inside, a cut in my lung, cuts on my left shoulder and right arm, and a fracture in my left leg. The news quickly spread, and soon there were many different versions of what happened. There were those who thought it was an accident, and those who thought Giovanni was to blame. He was held for eight hours because he saw what happened. After he was freed, he went in front of the TV cameras and tried to defend himself by saying that the car was still together, that I was driving, and that I had not noticed that another car was coming at full speed when I opened the door. It was a red-colored Suzuki that was taken away even though there were no blood stains, cuts, or fingerprints found. That same day, it was given back to its owner. A witness gave me information about the car that they said had thrown me. The cops were able to get in touch with the owner, a woman named Tatiana Chavez. They saw that the front of the car had a dent when they looked at it. They did not think twice about accusing the woman of killing me and putting her in pretrial detention. However, the prosecution did not rule out the chance that Giovanni was to blame. Around 10.30 in the morning, Jose Serrano, the Minister of the Interior, wrote on his Twitter account that, according to the latest police report, my death could have been a femicide and not a car accident. At eight at night, my body was moved to Guayaquil for my wake, which took place in the Voltaire Paladines Polo Coliseum. Around 11 that same day, more than 1,000 people came, including fans of mine and friends from show business, family friends, such as my daughter Samantha and my ex-husband Eduardo, were also present. My remains were moved to the Parque de la Paz Cemetery in Duran to be buried there. More than 1,000 individuals also gathered. While the event was taking place, Minister Jose Serrano revealed that a judge had ordered preventive detention against my husband. There was still a long process until I could rest in peace. On Monday the 5th, the version of the only witness to the events, my son, came. Dr. Blum told the prosecution that after the accident, he took the boy and took him to the family's house where he had spent the new year. There, the little boy began to describe what had happened. He told me over and over that his dad was bad and had pushed me. After that, a psychological team from the prosecutors looked at the boy, but Giovanni's lawyer did not want the child to speak against his father. But there were still more people who said bad things about him. Samantha brought a specific charge against Giovanni to the attention of the prosecutors on January 8th. The charge against me was femicide, and it was said that I had died not in a car accident, but because of an abusive relationship with the person who was being charged. She told me that I had tried to break up with Giovanni, 
but he told me that I would have to pay him $100,000 for every year we were together. I was so scared that I planned to run away with my kids to Spain. I went on a tour there, and that would be a great time. I had reported gender abuse not long before I died. It was added to this strong message that the autopsy results were in. It showed that the bruises and other injuries I had were from before the crash. It also showed that I had hurt myself with the seatbelt in the car, probably while trying to protect myself from Giovanni's threats. Lastly, the expert reports showed that I was not driving the car from which I was thrown. I broke my head in the fall and was in a coma before the other car hit me. All of this was added to by the call I made just before I died and a number of accounts from other people I knew. Finally, Giovanni was officially charged with my murder and sent to preventative detention. But there were still some riddles that had not been solved because there was still another suspect. On February 13, two young people went to the police station to say that 45 minutes later, the car that they said had hit me had actually hit them. When the schedule was looked at, it was clear that the event in question caused the dent in Tatiana's car. The charges against her were dropped and she was freed. After the crash, investigators got to work to find the real person responsible. They found the car after looking at 38 tapes from security cameras along the route. A man named Luis Miguel Correa Davila owned it. When they finally found him, they began to check out his car. The windows were broken and had been changed. The man chose to tell everything. He was the one who hit me. He was charged with culpable murder. Giovanni was still blamed for pushing me out of the car, though. For the crime of culpable murder, Judge Oscar Galan of Santa Elena put him away from freedom for two years on June 30th. When my family got this, they were sad because it seemed so unfair to them. First, because he had only been in jail for a short time compared to how bad the crime was. Second, because they wanted it to be considered femicide. On August 13th, the people in charge of the process were taken off duty. The new judges at the Santa Elena Criminal Court made a strong order that threw out everything that had been done in the case up to the trial hearing and changed the type of crime to femicide. The main reason was that new proof had come in, like text messages between me and Giovanni that showed he was trying to get me to stay with him by threatening to hurt me if I did. Even though this was good news for my family, Luis still had to be cleared of murder because Samantha wanted her dad to be fully charged. On October 10th, Luis was put on trial. At that point, Jorge Torres, who was in charge of the investigation as a prosecutor, said that it had been found that the suspect was going at 38 miles an hour. In other words, he had not broken any external duty of care. He also said that the details of the event had been taken into account, even though it had been proven that the violation was important. Finally, Luis was found not guilty of causing death by negligence. The man walked out of the building with his mother by his side, crying with emotion. He said to the press that it had been a long road, but he was glad that he had been found not guilty. She then gave them both a hug and talked to the press, where she said that the person who put her mother on the road still needed to be judged. The case was heard again on October 29th in Santa Helena's first court of criminal promises. From the expert proof, it was clear that Giovanni and I had a fight because she wanted him to take care of our son, and he refused. Following this, he started hitting me right away. After we fought, he pushed me toward the road so that a car would hit me. The accused was also shown to have egotistical traits and a tendency to be violent. Giovanni was found guilty of killing me and given a 26-year prison term. The judge also said he had to pay a fine of $800 basic income and give $1,000 to my family as compensation. The defense took the sentence to an appeals court, but the prosecution said that the evidence given at the trial was valid according to the rules of evidence. On January 6, 2016, the Santa Helena Provincial Court upheld the court's sentence. He went so far as to say that female groups were making political points out of my case. Not only that, but my family also had to go through another very hard time. Pics of my body in the morgue were shared on social networks on the day I died. Samantha and lawyer Anna Lusuriaga began a case against two nurses from the Gregorio Panchana Hospital in the province of Santa Elena on March 14, 2016, for the crime of abuse of privacy. But good things came out of all the pain. 
The show Sharon La Hechichera came out on August 14th, 2018. It told the story of how I was able to break away from the traditional ways of the men-dominated Ecuadorian music business at the time. It also stressed how I had reached my goal despite my financial situation and the violence against women I faced from Giovanni. Many people became more aware of problems after watching the show, which got good reviews. But bad news came back. The medical staff at the Gregorio Panchana Hospital were fired by the first court of criminal assurance in the province of Santa Helena on September 30th, 2019. It was not clear if they were the ones who took the pictures that were going around the internet. Even though it had been almost five years since the crime, I still could not sleep. Giovanni is still serving his time in the Rio Bamba Social Recovery Center as of today. He is adamant that my death was caused by a car accident and not by femicide. Seven out of 10 Ecuadorian women have been victims of some kind of violence against women, and one in four has been victims of domestic violence. What happened to me was not the only one. Because I was a famous woman, my case had a big effect. It is hoped that this will set a standard so that these crimes will never go unpunished again.